news. The first of May. Wait, we closed out April. Here comes May. What, what does May bring? May flowers, that's right. It also brings the black flies, mosquitoes, <laughs> um, the church picnic coming up, the church cleanup day. Hey, what's going on? Hey, you're on the wrong side of the church this morning. Hey, and I see, uh, I see uh, Joan and Jim and well, nice job, folks, mixing it up. I'm going to invite you to uh, open up your bulletin. Got a lot to disseminate this morning. Lots going on. And good morning. If you're visiting here today, uh, you're very welcome to be here. Glad you're here. Um, let's see. There, we'll be resuming our Wednesday night activities uh, this Wednesday night, except for Thrive. They're going to take that night off to rest because they're not here this morning. They're up to Camp Shiloh. Um, I'm the B team. I'm the guy who's running the screens uh, today, so if anything's going on like a squirrel, that's my fault. Um, all right, uh, Sunday the 14th, actually Saturday the 14th is a very big day for us here. Um, we're going to have a church cleanup. There's lots to do uh, here to get the campus back in, in order, uh, but many hands make light work, and last year was a great time. Um, this year quite isn't so bad with the, uh, the amount of uh, dirt and stones that are pushed along the uh, parking lot, so uh, that much cleanup is not that bad, but if you can please show up, uh, I believe at 8 a.m. to, to 1, 1 p.m., there's going to be a wonderful um, uh, barbecue, uh, hot burgers and hot dogs, and then there's going to be a Grand Prix, so if you're a wanna, we're going to be making our cards and we're going to have a Grand Prix race here uh, Saturday afternoon. That's the 14th. The 15th. Uh, we're going to have a new Covenant Members Church class. So if you're interested in getting to learn more about who we are here at Hope in Christ Church, let myself or any of the elders know because we're going to do that. It's going to be a couple of hours after church on the 15th. Uh, a summer group will be sharing uh, starting up in June. Um, the topic is Foundational Doctrines of the Christian Faith. So please sign up. Um, in the foyer, there will be a sheet hanging there. And if you are interested in getting baptized or a baby dedication, please see Pastor Steve or, or any of the elders uh, to let us know about that. Pastor Steve is not here today. He's on vacation. He's been away. And we are going to have a guest speaker today, Pastor Kevin Miranda. Um, I'll be introducing him in a bit. But uh, Steve's away, and we have the blessings of Pastor uh, Kevin to bring us the message today. Um, so... Next Sunday after church, there'll be a brief meeting, real brief. Uh, Dee's called for a hospitality meeting, okay? So next Sunday after church, just a brief meeting. And I've been asked to remind you folks that if you've brought dishes here, they're still sitting in the kitchen. So get your dishes, uh, to get them back home to you, please. So we have the privilege today to be here with each other, coming before the Lord to worship. Would you bow me, please? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that you've called us to set apart in our lives to come before you and to worship you, Lord. Help me, um, help us to give you the glory that you are due. <coughs> help us to worship you. Um, free us from uh, the bondage of the distractions that we have before us and beside us and behind us to truly give you what you deserve. Lord, be with the kids that are uh, up at Shiloh. Thank you for uh, the blessings that they could be away. And I pray that um, they could hear the truth as we need to hear the truth about your son, Jesus Christ, and your great love for us. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. You stand as we continue this morning. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord.
servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father, I have made up to you. Worship team. Thankfully, I'm not crying like usual. Anyway, my name's Rachel. <laughs> Welcome to Hope in Christ Church again, and um, just happy to see you all here. I get to be a part of the missions team, which is um, super exciting, and, and there's been a lot of great things going on, so I am going to run through a few things, but partly because we've all been participating so much with a few of our missionaries lately by giving, and then we just have some great reports about it. So, I um, just bear with me. Anyway, first of all, I just want to let you guys know, Yesu Potam and Monica, they are missionaries we support through Love and Care Ministries. Uh, India, around the world, a new development, well, not new, but they're working on a place in Vermont, which is not too far from here, so that's kind of cool. And they are planning on coming to visit this summer, so we're not sure exactly when, I have not yet met them in person, but I'm really looking forward to it. I'm kind of a visual person, so I've tried to get to know the missionaries through their letters and pictures, but I'm looking forward to meeting them in person. So they'll be able to share with us, and we can um, learn more how things are going with them. But one of the praise reports they did have is they're buying a building in Vermont, 
and according to their letter, they were supposed to have closed on April 29th, so just recently, and they mentioned that miracles. He said, the Lord did amazing miracles this past month by providing $100,000 for the down payment, so that's awesome. And also the seller, I thought this was really cool. The seller shockingly agreed to be our bank and let us pay the rest of the money over the next three years. Um, this is an amazing Jewish man. He never knew us before, but was so touched by the work we were doing to reach the homeless and the needy, he eagerly agreed to do us this favor. So praise God for that. So I'm sure we'll hear more about that in the future. The next missionary I wanted to mention is the Denisons. And if you guys remember a few weeks ago, we had an opportunity to collect for the journals for the youth. And this church has been so generous, and so we were able to send money to them. And they had, I think it was three new, um, yeah, Activate Youth Groups in March. So, and this church has been a part of that because we pray and sent money for the journal. So well done. So that's exciting that we can be a part of that too. They um, also had a neat little story. I'm just sharing these things so you guys hopefully will be encouraged and feel connected. But um, <laughs> So this, the Denisons had some children come by their house asking for food. They shared the gospel with them, gave them gospel bracelets and a small sack of food, and then they invited them to come to their office, which was just a three-minute walk away every Friday at 10, play some games, visit, have another snack, get another little sack of food. And they came. And they also brought friends with them. So they had been ministering to this small group of kids every Friday and just taking the opportunities that God, you know, is providing. So that's exciting. And then um, we also participated in collecting money for Ukraine. So it was Alexander, no, Vitali and Alexandra. There they are. Oh, you guys are good with the pictures. Thank you. Um, that's awesome. So they, we collected money to send to them, and they're working with the refugees from Ukraine. And so I just also wanted to update you on that. We, did, we do have letters, and I did notice in the bulletin there's a whole prayer list for the missionaries. And if anybody does want the actual letters, we could definitely, you know, email. I printed them. It didn't come out that great, though. So we could email them to you. And Paul is super good with email, so <laughs> you can ask her. Anyway, um, so Alexander, I'm sorry. They had a friend, Alexander. So Vitaly and Alexandra are ministering in Ukraine to the refugees. They had a friend, Alexander, who lived outside the city, one of the cities they evacuated. They wanted the mom to evacuate too, and she didn't want to. And they were praying that she would. <clears throat> finally, I'm kind of summarizing, finally she decided she would leave. They prayed on Wednesday that God would lead Alexander's mother out of the city. She left, and then two hours after got a call from a neighbor that her home was destroyed. So they were just praising God that she's safe. Obviously, your home is destroyed, but we're just thanking God for that provision. Um, there was another family that was in a basement for about a month, and then they fled as soon as they were able to, and now they're with them in Switzerland. And he says, this is God's miracle. So a few of these missionary letters keep mentioning God's miracles. So I thought that was very encouraging. So God, and they also reported that God is keeping their church safe. So they were in Kiev, now they're, they're not. But he says that they have not lost one brother or sister from their church in the war. So they are just praising God for his protection for them. And one of their brothers, Zenya, we can pray for. He serves in the army at a checkpoint on one of the roads. And he's reporting that the local people are continuing to care for and provide for the soldiers. So in the midst of horrifying crisis, they're still seeing miracles that God is doing. So just a wonderful report. So they appreciate all of the love and support by prayer and financial that we give. So I just wanted you guys to be encouraged and blessed by that too. And lastly, 
We will have another opportunity to give and participate soon with the Care Women's Center, which is right in Concord here. And so next Sunday is Mother's Day already. So starting next Sunday and then to Father's Day, um, we usually call it the baby bottle drive, but we're going to do maybe a baby box drive. So we're going to have a bin in the foyer decorated, and you guys can, can give as the Lord leads to support that ministry. Um, Kelly runs the center over there, and we'll be collecting between Mother's Day and Father's Day. So that will be exciting. The and I'm just going to throw this out there at the risk that you'll all want to come. Um, but we're going to go visit the center on May 18th at 5. It's a Wednesday evening. Um, a few of us are going to go. We want to tour the center, meet Kelly, and just kind of see how God might have us personally or as a church be involved there. So just an opportunity. So anyway, God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Oh, so sorry. The kids are dismissed for Kids Church. We'll have a brief break and then Todd will collect us back. Thank you. Folks, I'll let you wind down, wind down your greetings, call this back to worship. All right, as we find our ways back to our chairs and I did forget to mention um, 
something that is a, a need, an upcoming need uh, that the church has. And since I've been here, we've been blessed with this beautiful piano over here. Uh, but every once in a while, it'll decide not to work. So what we decided to do is to be proactive, I guess semi-proactive. And instead of waiting for it to, to break on us during a church service, um, we're going to be proactive, semi-proactive, and we're going to ask for collections uh, ahead of time so that we can get it replaced before it breaks. Um, there's been some research uh, done on um, pianos, electric pianos, um, and they range from you know small dollars to big dollars. And we've had some, some wisdom given to us where um, we've been selected one piano, and it's really uh, the middle, it's small dollars. It's around um, $2,500 for a piano. Um, so we're gonna start asking for collections next Sunday, um, and we'll keep collecting in, until we're provided with the funds to purchase uh, for a new piano. So um, Pastor Steve is on vacation, and when he goes away on vacation, we have the option to either one of the elders um, prepare a message or um, look for uh, someone to come. And we decided to have someone else come, and Steve was very excited to um, ask Pastor Kevin Miranda up to share with us this, this message. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, Pastor Kevin um, from, from Charles River. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Miranda. Uh, Pastor Steve and I went to church together a long, long time ago at uh, First Baptist Church in Duxbury, Massachusetts, where uh, we were discipled by the same guy, Dr. J. And uh, it is, um, he's invited me up here a number of times, and finally it worked out. So I am, I am thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for all of your hospitality. Uh, it was a beautiful drive up. Unfortunately, my family wasn't able to join me this time. Uh, I had committed to take my son to the New England Revolution game last night. And uh, we got in late, and he was still in bed when I tried to. So um, it wasn't worth the fight. Uh, but anyway, hopefully next time uh, they'll, be, they'll be able to join us. Um, let, me, let me pray, uh, because I am genuinely anxious and excited to bring you uh, this message this morning. But I would hate to try and do it in my own strength. So let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, you are God, and we are not. And we first and foremost want to confess that. Lord, it's our desire deeply uh, to know you and to obey you and to love you and to bring others in on that as well. And so, Lord, as I open up your word today, as we collectively open up your word today, um, Lord, would you sharpen our minds to understand what it is that you're saying to us? And would you soften our hearts uh, to receive it with joy? I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, I am uh, Kevin Miranda. I get to be the discipleship pastor now at a uh, church in southwest Boston proper. Uh, we serve primarily the, the neighborhoods of West Roxbury, Roslindale, Jamaica Plain, and even uh, Chestnut Hill and a little bit of Dedham. Um, so, and I've been there for, uh, gosh, eight or nine years. Been on staff there for about six years. And... Uh, one of the things in our DNA, just to kind of give you a little of the backstory, that a little uh, what's in Charles River Church's DNA is church planting and low income housing. And so, just what kind of if you're if you're curious, I'm I'm happy to to talk about that uh, after after the sermon, after the gathering this morning. But um, in the 11 years, we call it a church plant. It is 11 years old, but it is still very much a church plant. It feels like we're kind of starting to mature into into something a little bit healthier than than a sprout, but. Um, but one of the things that God has enabled us to do is we treat our church kind of like hospitals treat uh, residency programs. So we'll invite people in. We're still we're working on developing people from within, but we'll invite pastors in who are interested in church planting. And so far, we've been able to uh, send one of those pastors out to um, a church restoration on the North Shore of Boston in Manchester by the Sea, where uh, he just... Um, his congregation is growing. It's just beautiful things happening there. And uh, we've been able to help plant two other churches, one in Charlestown, Massachusetts, uh, which they just got a building. And it is the oldest building, the oldest church building 
in the city of Boston. It, it, primarily, it was uh, originally it was uh, First Church Charlestown, where John Harvard was the pastor at one point. So this pastor uh, that we were able to have a residency with, whenever Harvard has a commencement, he gets to sit on the stage now, uh, which is just wild. And then another one in the Fenway area, which is serving more primarily um, college students. So God has been tremendously faithful. And uh, it's not been easy, but God has been tremendously faithful. And we're working on one right now with a local guy from Dorchester who is looking to plant in Dorchester. And, uh, and so he's a, he's a ways off, but he's on his way. So uh, we're, we're grateful for that. And, and secondarily, we're really uh, what's in our DNA is um, low-income housing developments. We, we actually were given free office space in a low-income housing development uh, based on the work that we were doing there. And we're not content with that. We want to plant little uh, gospel lighthouses in, there are, there are a bunch of low-income housing developments all the way down Washington Street from West Roxbury all the way down to Chinatown. So we, we say we're going to take it down to Chinatown. We, we want to plant little lighthouses all the way down to Chinatown. So those are the, those are the two primary things that kind of mark Charles River Church's DNA. And if, as I said, if you guys have any questions or, uh, or want to know more about that, I am happy to talk afterwards. But as I said... Uh, I am Kevin Mirando, uh, discipleship pastor at Charles River Church. So I didn't plant the church, but I am the discipleship pastor there. And uh, a couple years ago, my brother had this brilliant idea. See, I used to be Irish-Italian. It's a weird thing to say. But my brother had this great idea to get the DNA test done. And it turns out, while I am about 45% Irish, I'm not Italian. Uh, there's no Italian in my blood. Uh, it turns out I'm about 55% Sardinian and Spanish and Jewish and Middle Eastern. Uh, and Sardinia is a big island off the coast of Italy, but it has its very own culture. And so fortunately, um, he, he did this test after my grandfather had passed away. Because if he had known that he wasn't Italian, he's from Calabria, Italy. But if he had known, I checked and it's okay. Like I still get to eat lasagna, so I'm not all that mad. Um, <laughs> But I, at, now I get to eat tapas and hummus as well. So, and, and it explains why I always want to take a siesta. Um, but it got me thinking about my ancestors, right? You know, it, I know virtually nothing about the people who lived, like from my own bloodline, who lived just 100 years ago. Almost nothing. And so all of their sorrows, all of their joys, all of their pain, all of their heartache, all of their highs and lows, the things that kept them up at night. I have no idea. Every single one of those things led to me here right now. And you guys all have the same story. You're all here. And so obviously you are coming from somebody. But, but how many of us know anything about the people who lived 100 or even 200 years ago, and yet all of their decisions led to you here right now. So I, I, I have three kids. I have Zoe. She's 10. She's the oldest. I have Levi. He's the middle son. Uh, he's eight years old. And then I have Evangeline, who is almost four. And um, so Levi is the last currently. I have one brother, but he doesn't have any kids yet. And so Levi is the last hope of the Mirando name living on through my, my stream of the family tree, to mix metaphors. And, uh, and he, he's eight, like I said. He, he loves to drum. He loves to play soccer. Um, he's a great kid. Um, my father's name is Steve. Uh, originally from Dorchester, Massachusetts as well. Uh, he went to technical school at Don Bosco. He was an estimator for power plants for years and years and years. He volunteered to lead my Boy Scout troop. Uh, he coached all my Little League. He coached my basketball. He, he taught me to love uh, Dylan and Clapton and Motown and Elvis Presley. Amen. Amen. Um, he loves to garden. He loves his grandkids. Uh, my grandfather's name is Albert. Technically, when he was born, it was Umberto. He was born in Calabria, Italy, uh, just the tip of the boot. Um, and he immigrated to Boston through Ellis Island in the 1930s. He worked as a custodian in Boston public schools for years and years and years. He retired and then realized, uh, I'm going to divorce if I don't get another job. So he went back at a part-time job and, uh, and ended up getting employee of the year as, at 75 years old at his part-time job. We gave him a big ham and a whole big thing. Um, so that should tell you a little bit about who my grandfather was. I found out after he passed away, actually, that he had served in Korea. Had no idea. He never talked about it. Um, and I also saw pictures of him smoking cigarettes at that time, which 
anyway. <laughs> uh, but when my wife and I were married, um, he lived in Roslindale, and he invited us into his two-family home um, to the first floor because it was vacant, and he charged us really, really cheap rent so we could get on our feet as a young married couple. He was actively involved in the Sons of Italy. He was generous and kind, and he told the best bad jokes. Uh, just the best bad jokes. One of my favorite stories, this isn't one of his bad jokes, but one of my favorite stories, um, he was making a soup. My grandmother uh, couldn't make it at this time, so he was making a soup, and she, she just goes, Al, you're going to ruin it. Like, it was just, it was beautiful. But anyway, um, my great-grandfather, this is my great-grandfather. This is Michelangelo Miranda. And that is actually his name, Michelangelo Miranda. So what I know about Michelangelo is that um, he immigrated to Boston through Ellis Island in, uh, in the 1930s. He got a job paving the streets, and, um, and that's roughly all I know about him. That's what he looked like. What a good-looking guy. Um, and then his father, check out this, Gun Batista. Miranda. That was his real name, Gun Batista Miranda. And so here's what I know about him. He lived in Calabria. Uh, he had a wife named Carmela, and he had at least one son named Michelangelo. I don't know anything about Gun Batista other than that. And so again, all of those ups, all of those downs, all of those, all of the anxious nights and the worried thoughts and the joys and the celebrations and every, like, I don't know what was his favorite food. I've no idea, probably meatballs, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but they're all faded away. And I'm just left with the name Gun Batista. And here's the thing. Someday my great, great grandkids will know basically as much about me as I know about Gun Batista. They'll know a name, and that's basically it, until, until they don't even remember that, because I don't know Gun Batista's father's name. But he definitely had one. <laughs> but I, and I, so I know nothing, I know nothing about that. So, so death kind of helps us sort out our, our priorities, doesn't it? It kind of puts things into perspective. What's truly important? Like, we're all busy people. I'm assuming that we're all busy people. I can speak for Boston. It's, it's too rushed. It's too crazy. It's too busy. People take pride in how busy their schedules are. And I don't think it's that far off to say that Chinchester might be similar. But we're all busy. But are we busying ourselves with things that are worth being busy with. So I want you to open your Bibles with me to Proverbs chapter 22. As a, as a guest preacher this morning, I'm not going to exegete a, a big swath of scripture. I don't think that's my role here this morning. I assume that Pastor Steve is taking care of you and taking you through scripture, digging deep and, and mining the depths and, and really teaching. As, as a guest preacher this morning, I don't, I don't see that as my role. I want to take just a basic principle from scripture and I want to use some other scripture and, and basic biblical principles to kind of round that out and to challenge and encourage all of us to sort out our priorities, to live in a world that is increasingly more and more difficult to live in as somebody who wants to follow Jesus faithfully. I want to challenge and encourage all of us to, to see Jesus as that treasure who is worth selling everything else in order to obtain I want to challenge every single one of us to, to not be like that, that one man in the parable who was given the talent and just kind of buried it in the sand and waited, but to invest that talent in whatever way that God is calling us to live and to remind us all that, that despite whatever circumstances, that God always wins. Always. And so Proverbs 22.1, very simple, doesn't mean it's easy. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. Let me read it one more time. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. Now, Proverbs is one of the, the wisdom books in the Old Testament, and along with Job and Ecclesiastes. They're, they're the, the type of literature that it is, it is God's word, but it is wisdom literature. So it's intended for us to read, and, and not just kind of digest right away, but to kind of chew on, to kind of wait and let it, let it simmer so that we can read it. We can, as, as we meditate on it, we kind of unlock some of its secrets. So we're not supposed to read that and go, 
great, a good name is, okay, got it, check, next. No, we're supposed to read that, we're supposed to simmer on it, we're supposed to consider it, we're supposed to let it change our minds, change our hearts, change the way that we live. And, and the book of Proverbs, it begins with this encouragement, it, it begins with this warning from a father to a son, if you remember Proverbs 1 through 7, that the, the reader would ponder this. Son, listen to my words, ponder these things in your heart, meditate upon these things, and then in, in reflecting on them, that we would have our minds and hearts more aligned to God's mind and God's heart so that we can live more wisely in the world that he has entrusted to us. Because he has made the world to work in a certain way. And so he's given us these things so that we can then read them and meditate upon them and then change accordingly so that we can live wisely in a, in a broken world. So the, the wise person is going to read these things they're going to meditate on them. They're going to ponder them. They're going to let it change their hearts, change their minds, while the fool will ignore them. It's similar to what my dad used to tell me. Son, don't be an idiot. But he, un, unsurprisingly, the Bible is far more eloquent than my father, um, even though he's, he's great. But let's take all of that and import it onto the text this morning. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. So, so a wise person is going to uh, have more priority, give more priority to having a good name rather than great wealth. That's the Kevin Mirando tran translation. But the, the, the question naturally comes then, okay, uh, so what's it mean to have a good name? Because Michelangelo is a good name, and Gun Batista is a good name. But that's obviously not what the text is talking about this morning. And if you think about names in the Bible, the, the, the authors of Scripture, when they include people's names, and God, who is the storyteller, as he is naming people, uh, it's, it's incredibly intentional. Uh, just one example. So you think about Jacob in the Old Testament. Jacob, what's his name mean? It means deceiver. And what does Jacob do for the first half of his life? He deceives constantly, over and over. He deceives his father. He deceives his brother. He's, he's a deceiver until one night he meets the angel of the Lord and, the, and, and they wrestle all night long until the angel kind of displaces his hip. And then he is renamed wrestler, struggler, Israel. Israel meaning wrestles with God, wrestler. So when we say a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, I, I think that what we're saying is that that name... It's your reputation. It's, it's, it's who you are. So when I hear my wife's name, I don't just hear Pam. That doesn't just fall on deaf ears. I hear Pam Mirando and my ears perk up because whatever comes out of your mouth next, you better be very careful because I love that woman. And so, but like when I hear her name, it, it sparks more than just information. It sparks emotion. It evokes an emotion, right? Names convey emotion, both good and Bad. It's the phonetic representation of who you are. So your reputation, a great name, is to be chosen rather than great riches. I, when, uh, I, I don't have Twitter, but a friend of mine showed me um, this tweet one time, and it, it killed me. I thought it was hilarious. Um, and he said, it, the, the tweet read, uh, the best thing about trying to name a baby is realizing how many people you hate. Like, have you ever been there? Like, like, like you're sitting there with your, with your spouse and you're, you're, you know, you're throwing names back and forth and going through the baby book and it's like, ooh, what about Mandy? And I apologize if your name is Mandy in here. I don't know. But like, ooh, what about Mandy? And it's like, oh, no, not Mandy. Like, I knew Mandy in high school and there's no chance I am naming my offspring. after. I mean, I haven't thought about her in 20 years, but no. No way. Like, right? Because it, invades, it conveys more than just information. It evokes emotion. Your name. Right? And so this proverb is telling us that the wise person is going to be much more concerned with their reputation, with, with who they are. And what people, like when, when people hear their name, what is, what, what is sparked? What, what does your name bring along with it? Like, what, what train cars are attached to your name? So I ask you, which is your priority? Great wealth or great reputation? Because we know what God's is, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What are we, what are we living for? What are you living for? 
Because, listen, you're going to be tempted. You know this. You're going to be tempted to compromise on your morals. You're going to be tempted to compromise just a, maybe even just a little bit in order to succeed, in order to gain, in order to achieve. Are you prepared for that? Are you prepared for that? How are your grandkids going to remember you? I can guarantee, almost guarantee, nothing is guaranteed, but I can almost guarantee that my great-grandkids are going to see this much of my acquired wealth. I'm a pastor. They're going to get <laughs> nothing. But I hope that they will know Jesus. I'll tell you this. Um, my great-uncle, <coughs> Uncle Tony, I, I met the guy like three times in my life. And I found out that he owned a, uh, he owned a cranberry bog and a, um, and a sandwich restaurant down in Carver, Massachusetts. And I, so it was called The Berry Guys. And so I found out Uncle Tony's got this shop. It's called The Berry Guys. And I tell my in-laws about it because they live down in that direction. And so they were like, great. So they went and they, they checked it out. And so they, they go in and they get to talking with the woman behind the counter. And she says, uh, or they say, hey, we, our daughter married a Mirando. And they find out, oh, it's, uh, it's Al Mirando's grandkid and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, Uncle Al, he was fantastic. And they're swapping stories for a long time and, and this and that. And, and by the end of it, um, they refused to take my in-law's money. So they got a free lunch because they were associated with me and I'm associated with my grandfather because a good name is to be valued more than great riches. I've only, I've, I like, I tell you what, I, I've met Uncle Tony, like, like I said, maybe three, four times. And even when that, like, I don't know if he would even recognize me. Like, he was off doing, you know, adult things with the adults, and I was just a little rascal running around doing rascal things. <laughs> Take a look at the screen here. I'm going to put up a graph. And I want to show you the popularity of a certain name over time. So you see, there's a name right here. So this is the popularity of a particular name in America. Uh, over a period of time. And so you can see it was fairly popular up through the 1800s, early 1900s, it was pretty popular. But then something happened in, in the mid-30s that, that caused this name to essentially go extinct. Nothing. Any guesses? It's Adolf. Absolutely. It's Adolf. What kind, of, what kind of sick, twisted individual would name their child Adolf after Hitler existed, right? But do you know what Adolf means? It means noble wolf. It's a pretty cool name, but because of the reputation of one sick, twisted Austrian psychopath, this name has gone extinct. When I was growing up as a, as a kid, my neighbor's name was Adolf. In fact, it was Adolf Savage, and he was a wonderful guy, but I'm not going to name my son after him. I put one more name up there. Uh, uh, sorry, one more, one more graph up there. So this is a different name, and you can see it was real popular in, all throughout, you got up into the 1940s, you see a spike, and then early, like late 40s, early 50s, big spike, and then it drops off big time in the early 2000s. This is Dwight. For Dwight D. Eisenhower, the general of the uh, American troops, and then later president of the United States. So you see a nice little spike when he was the general. You see a bigger spike when he's the president. And then uh, the television program, The Office, shows up. <laughs> and Dwight is no longer... People aren't being named after Dwight. No. But you can see... But you know what Dwight means? It means white, blonde. Far more popular name than Noble Wolf. But if, if, like, if I'm given an option to, to name my kid either Dwight or Adolf, you better believe I'm picking Dwight, even though it's the office guy. Right? But if you, if you ask me, what, which nickname do you want? You want Blonde or Noble Wolf? Like, I want Noble Wolf. Until I find out that it's associated with Adolf Hitler. Then I'll, I'll go Blondie all day. <laughs> but you get it. So let's change gears real quick and say, okay, that was all great, but what does this mean for me? What does this mean for me? Let's take a, I want to take a step back and really think about what is happening right now in this moment, like meta level. So right now we are all sitting inside of a building in, in New Hampshire and I'm speaking and you're listening. Meanwhile, we are sitting on a ball 
that is flying through space at Mach 86 around another huge ball with another little ball going around our ball. And, and we're, we're all just like, yeah, of course that's what we're doing. It's like, wait a minute, of course that's what, that's insanity. Like this is, this world is fantasy. Like, check this out. Um, my daughter at home was given uh, a little caterpillar in a, in a thing. And, and this caterpillar is going to turn into a butterfly in real life. Like that's not a make-believe story that we tell children. Like that caterpillar, this, she named it Spiky because it's gross and spiky. Like this little fuzzy, nasty, whoop, this little fuzzy, nasty little bug is going to someday, just out of the blue, realize, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to attach myself to the lid of this thing and I'm going to form this crystallis around me. And then inside that, I'm going to turn into goop and then reassemble myself, except this time with beautiful wings. And when I hatch, I'm flying to Mexico with all the other ones that have done the exact same thing. And it's going to take us three generations to get there. Like that is, that's reality. That's not a fantasy that we make up and like to entertain children. Like tadpoles actually turn into frogs. If you've not looked up the life cycle of a dragonfly, it'll blow your mind. I watched a documentary about it one time before I fell asleep. And then I woke up the next morning thinking, I must have dreamed that. Because there's no way that it starts off in the water with jet propulsion and ends up with piston wings and 360 degree vision. It's just insanity, and, but it's real and we just take it for granted. I'm telling you, this world is a fantasy world, but it's real. It's, it's far more fantastical than anything that Tolkien could have created. Far more. It, it's, it's breathed by the author of this world. This pulpit is a word that is breathed by God. This table is a word that is breathed by God. You are a word. You are a living character in God's story. I've been reading The Hobbit to my kids, the, my older ones. My, three, my eight-year-old isn't ready for it, but I'm reading it to them anyway. Um, but I'll tell you what, it's way more fun. Like, I'm finding it far more rewarding than, no offense, but like, I used to read the same Curious George book to my kids every single night for like 70 nights in a row. And the big problem in that book was that George messed up an ice cream shop. And then the solution was people saw a monkey making ice cream, so they all came in and gave the, the owner a ton of money. And so like, small problem, small reward. Great for kids. But like, big problem, the Hobbit, he's got to go kill a dragon. He just wants to sit in his hole and like blow smoke rings and eat bacon. Like, big problem, big challenge, big reward. Um, one of my favorite authors, a man named Andy Wilson, and um, he, says, he, he says this, Life is a story. Why do we die? Because we live. Why do we live? Because our maker opened his mouth and began to tell a story. So who are you? What is your character like? Are you the grumpy neighbor? Are you the jealous girlfriend? Are you the winsome in public but privately like vindictive uh, friend? The straight A student with a secret? Like, who are you? You are somebody. But we all have this, um, this, this certain thing where we, we, want, we think that we all have our own soundtrack and we're all, we're all kind of sympathetic. But if, if I was written by a master novelist, if, if my story was written by Tolkien, I probably wouldn't like the person that I read on the page. You are somebody. You are a character in God's living story. So which one are you? What are your motivations? What are your passions? What character do you desire to be? And then what are you doing to bridge the gap between who you currently are and the character that you desire to be? It's sneaky, and we'll get there. But the Westminster Catechism, right, it gloriously states that, that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Amen. Amen. Glorify God and enjoy him forever. But I'll tell you a secret. That is trite unless you put flesh on it. How specifically has God called you to glorify him? 
Now we can glorify God in what we eat and how we drink and how we, but like specifically, it's great to answer that question in a Sunday school class, but when you're in your workplace, what's that look like? It's great to memorize that in order to put it down on a piece of paper, but what does that look like when your neighbors are over? How specifically has God created you to glorify him? Are you trying to make much of yourself and to store up treasures that moth and rust will destroy? Or are you trying to make much of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God? Because Jesus said those who lose their life will find it. We have to lose our lives every single day and pick up his in order to find our own. You are uniquely and carefully and intentionally designed and placed uniquely and carefully and intentionally right where you are in order that you can glorify God and enjoy him among your neighbors so that you can bring the kingdom of God everywhere you go. And here's what really comes, like this is, this is the part that I love, is that as a character, you don't have to know what happens on the next page. And you don't have to know what happens at the end of the book because you know the author. And so he is always only good. So, so step one, the two things to do in order to become a more fruitful character. One is know the story. What is the story that you are living in? What is the story that you have imported into your life, that you have grafted yourself into? Does this sum up your story of, of Christianity? Jesus died for me so that I can go to heaven when I die. With all due respect, it's a boring story. It's not untrue, but there are better ways to tell it. Before you get Pastor Steve on the phone and say you invited a heretic, <laughs> it is true, but it's boring. That's not, that's not the story. Give God a little bit more credit than that. He is good. He is not boring. Amen. God is not boring. Trust in Jesus so that you can go to heaven when you die is a boring story. Step one, um, give your life to Jesus. Step two, try not to sin too much. Step three, wait to die. What a dull story. That's, I don't want, like, I'm not bought into that. That story kind of stinks. Now, it is true, it is just not, it, it's anemic. It's not fleshed up, right? So how about this? How about this for a story? God, the one who needs nothing, the all-powerful, he, he creates this lush, beautiful world. And in, it puts creatures on it in his own image to partner with in order to spread his glory, in order to, to make culture and to show off just how wonderful and amazing he is. He makes them like him. And then very quickly, they launch a mutiny against him. And rather than just wiping them away and saying, um, well, that tried that. No, he loves these creatures. And he says, no, I'm not going to let you ruin this. I'm going to launch a secret rescue mission. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the right time, he looks down on his world and he sends his own son on a recon mission behind enemy territory to show what he is truly like, full of love and mercy and compassion. The one who isn't put off by the outcast, the one who goes to the outcast. And then... He lets that world that he created murder him in the most gruesome way imaginable. But the secret plan the whole time was that that was all part of the plan. The son needed to die in order to take the consequence of the sin, of that initial mutiny, of that initial rebellion, so that those rebels could be brought back in. And, and you get to be a part of that. Listen, chapter 2, they go to the tomb, and it's empty. Like, for real, in real life, like the butterfly. It's a real fantasy. Like, it's true. He wasn't there. He was alive. Like, in history, truly, they couldn't find his body because it was alive. And then he starts appearing to them and showing himself to them, to over 500 people at one time, saying, listen, 
Go, I'm leaving again, but go. I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit so that you can go into enemy, enemy territory, so that you can be a part of this, so that you can help invite and restore and bring back my people. That's a better story. That's something that I can get behind. That's something that I can give my life towards. I'm excited for that one. Another, another quote by N.D. Wilson. He says this, Clear your throat and open your eyes. You are on a stage. The lights are on. It's only natural if you're sweating. Because this isn't make-believe. This is theater for keeps. Yeah? It's a massive stage, and there are millions of others on the stage with you. Yes, you can try to shake the fright by blending in, but it won't work. You have the Creator God's full attention. As much attention as he ever gave Napoleon, or Churchill, or even Moses or billions of other people who lived and died unknown, or a grain of sand, or one spike on one snowflake. You are spoken. You are seen. It is your turn to participate in creation. It is your turn to participate in creation. Like a kindergartner shoved out from behind the curtain during his first play, you might not know which scene you're in, or even what comes next. But God is far less patronizing than we are. You are his art, and he has no trouble stooping. You can even ask him for your lines. Beautiful. This is much more akin to reality. Reality, we've become so sophisticated and we're so mature that we forgot the wonder. God hasn't forgotten the wonder. So step one, know the story. Read it in scripture. The Bible is a tough read at points. It's, it can be rated R because the world is rated R. It tells the true story. Know the story. And know the author. Know the author of the story. God is always only good. God is not boring. Please give him credit. God is telling... I was looking at a bush one time. This is in my notes. I hope it goes well. I was looking at a bush one time as I was sitting on a college campus and and just praying that God would allow me to to get it. And I was praying with another guy, and we're looking at all the bumblebees just kind of circling around that bush and getting their honey. And I remember thinking, like, it's just a bee. And part of me just hopes I don't get stung. But, like, God knows every intricate cell inside of that bee. And he knows the, the, the heritage of that bee. Like, all the, like, I don't know, that bee may have stung Alexander the Great. Like, his great, 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 great. I have no idea. But, like, God knows all of that. And we're invi- he's inviting us into this story. Every good story has trials. Every good story has challenges, right? Like we talked about with The Hobbit. Low consequence, low reward. High risk, high reward. God has invited you into a high risk story with the ultimate reward. And every single one of these stories that he's telling us, every single person in this room, it's like this intricate 10 million trillion other moments. But all of your stories are pointing in some way, shape, or form to his mercy, to his grace, to his justice, to his love, to his patience. And those challenges, when you know the author of that story, that he is good and that he intends good for you, Those challenges and trials can actually turn into adventures. Not to downplay the the harshness of them, but like, I bet if you talk to Tolkien, he loved Bilbo Baggins. And he would write him into terrible, like we just read the part where Bilbo and and the trolls all get like uh, captured by a bunch of giant spiders. And like, while Tolkien was doing that, I don't think he was like, <laughs> take that, you little... Sit down with Tolkien. I, I bet he would have told you, like, I love Bilbo. And that's why I'm doing this to him. So you don't have to know what's on the next page when you know the reputation of the author. Right? Because the more you know him, the more you're going to love him. I can guarantee you that if he has opened your eyes to his goodness and his mercy. If you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, the more you know him, the more you will love him. And the more you love him, the more you will trust him. As he presents challenges in your way and you lean into him and you walk through that adventure alongside of him and he empowers you 
through that and you see his faithfulness, the more you're going to trust him. And the more you trust him, the more interesting you're going to let him make your story. So get to know the story that he wrote for you in Scripture. Read it regularly. Let it shape your thought life. Meditate on it. Meditate on it. Think on it. Memorize it. And get to know him in prayer. Like, I would love to talk to Tolkien, but I can't. Like, as I'm reading The Hobbit, I'd be like, why'd you do that? But he's, I can't do that. But, like, God has opened up the avenue where day or night, whatever, you can talk to him. And he's not going to say, listen, Kevin, here's what's going to happen. Uh, he, all he'll say is, hey, look at my faithfulness time and time again. Can you trust me again? Just like I tell my kids, this is too big for you to understand right now. You've got to go to the dentist. Can you just trust your dad that he loves you and this is going to be good for you? So Proverbs 22.1, it says, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and favor is better than silver or gold. But as, as we close out, I want to point out something that's tricky because, like I said, this is kind of subversive. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't hit you right away. It kind of digs under and then waits a little while and then there's an explosion. You don't get a good name by aiming at a good name. You don't get a good name by trying to get a good name. You get a good name by forgetting about you and believing Jesus when he says that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. To become blissfully self-forgetful. But here's the other thing. Christians, do you know who you're associated with? Do you know what name you have? Christian. You want name? You want to talk about a good name? Philippians 2. The Apostle Paul, writing to this church in Philippi, this group, this weak, small, fragile group of believers in Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, to them, and through them, the Holy Spirit has preserved it for us. And he says this, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to only his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being a obedient to the point of death even death on a cross therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father that's how this book ends. That's how this story ends. No matter what your chapter says, no matter what is on your next page, that's where this is all headed. That's where this is all going. I don't know what your reputation is going to be when the author writes you out of the story. But what is Jesus' reputation? What is his name? What train cars are, are linked to the name of Jesus in your neighborhood, in your family, in, in your workplace, in your school? When people hear Jesus, what kind of baggage are they taking along with it? When they hear the church, what kind of baggage, what kind of train cars are being hooked alongside of that? What are they bringing along with it? What are, we, what are we doing about it? We are loving. We are surprising. We are sharing stories of God's grace and his persistence and his patience and his diligence. We are sharing hope. 
So practical tool. If you've ever wondered, like, I really want to talk to my neighbor about Jesus, but I don't really know where to start. Like, if you get that, even just yellow light, like, maybe we're entering into spirituality. Two stories that I would challenge you to bring them to. Take them to the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. What a surprise that is. Where you have this Pharisee, this religious leader who is proud in his religiosity, and then you say, what? and then this tax collector who just beats his chest and says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Then ask him, what does that tell you about God's heart? Is that what you thought of God's heart? Is that what you thought it was? And maybe some of those train cars will start to unlink and the truth will be able to penetrate. And then take him to the story of, of uh, the prodigal son. I remember the first time I heard that story. I remember the first time I heard that story. It, it broke me. Like it shook everything I had. And then ask them, what does this tell you about God's heart? And is that what you thought God was like? What is preventing you from taking another step? God has gifted you. He has uniquely placed you and designed you and put you here now to go on this grand adventure with him, to share the hope that you have found in Jesus Christ with gentleness and respect. Let me close with a quote. Uh, from Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. You want to talk about a good name. (laughs) His advice for Christians was this. Preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. I love that. But catch it. Who said that? (laughs) Count, Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf. I haven't forgotten about him. Uh, a lot of people haven't forgotten about him. So it's kind of tricky, right? Like his, his goal was preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. This guy died 260 years ago and I'm talking about him today. Why? Because he was interested in Jesus Christ. He was interested in Jesus Christ and spreading his hope and his kingdom and not Nicholas's little kingdom, but Jesus's kingdom. And to be perfectly honest with you, I could care less if my great-great-grandkids know who Kevin Miranda was. But God help me if they don't know the name of Jesus Christ as gracious and generous. And we have that opportunity with small steps today to ensure that the world that they inhabit just looks a little bit more like the kingdom of God than it does right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are good as we sang this morning, simple statement, profound truth. You are good. You are holy. And, and so, so much bigger than we can fit in our minds. And Lord, we have offended you in 10 million different ways. So thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who took our offenses upon himself. to wipe us clean, to instill his righteousness onto us so that we can walk free, so that we can walk as, as beloved rather than with heads down trying to nervously earn your favor. Lord, I pray for this church that you would continue to keep your uh, favor upon it. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would breathe on this place and this community in a way that we have never seen before. God, empower these people to first and foremost know your steadfast, undying love towards them. And then out of that, be joyfully, joyfully obedient to your call. We trust you. And when we don't trust you, God, thank you for your faithfulness to us. pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for that message, uh, Pastor Kevin. That was that was wonderful. And at, at this time, we're going to say goodbye to our um, online viewers, the live streaming. And I hope you uh, you were blessed by uh, Kevin's sermon today. <laughs>